Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand. Jesus said every day has enough evil of its own. But according to the text, there is a day of evil. In warfare, both sides, opposing sides, scheme and plan. And in their planning, uh, there is always a D-Day. There's always a day to launch an assault that goes beyond the normal day's fighting. Are you with me? And so the passage tells us that Satan is scheming. And he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he's orchestrating things and planning to take us down. Every day, any day you can fail, any day you can fall. But there's a day when he launches an assault. And unless you have the armor, you're toast. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Please note that, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of of God. And some people leave this last section out as a piece of the armor. I think it's the heavy artillery. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And then Paul will close it out saying, Pray also for me. He knew he needed prayer. I think prayer is the heavy artillery. So there's the list. I don't know if any other, I don't know if I can't remember. I, I'm on Medicare now. I can't remember. I, get, I really am. I just got approved for Medicare. I'm really old now. But I don't remember any of the other Wednesday night teachers reading the whole passage. And I just thought I'd read the whole passage. But I'm assigned the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Lord, I pray, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Help me both through my notes that I have prepared and, Lord, if you choose, beyond the notes. Lord, just guide my thoughts in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me start right off the bat. The belt of truth is not the Word of God. Because I told you to note, when we read the whole list, just before the heavy artillery, uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, that's the Word of God. I like to say in regard to the sword, and I love teaching on the sword, but that's not my assignment tonight. And I like to say the more sword you have in your sheath, the more weapon you'll have in your hand. Jesus, when tempted in the wilderness by the devil... Uh, every time the devil tempted him, what did he do? He wielded the sword. It is written. It is written. And so 
The word of God is the sword of the spirit. And so we know uh, the belt of truth can't be the word of God because the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So the belt of truth is different than the word of God. It's not the word of God. What is it? First and foremost, it's walking in the light. Now, I want to turn and read from 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie. And do not live out or live by the truth. The belt of truth is walking in the light. You're not hiding anything. There's no hypocrisy. The word hypocrisy, uh, the, the word was used years ago for actors on stages and they would, um, it would refer to the face they were putting on to be the character and they were being somebody else. And there was the real person behind the mask, if you will. Hypocrisy. And Jesus said, watch out, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And then Luke chapter 12, he tells us it's hypocrisy. Now we're going to come back to that one before we're done because hypocrisy uh, deals with hidden things, hidden things. Now I'm going to give you a third point on this because I, I, I like to say that the belt of truth and I'm not trying to be rude or crude. I'm not trying to be that at all. I think it fits with, with thinking about this particular piece of armor. The belt of truth keeps your spiritual pants up. The belt of truth will keep you from being exposed, shamed. The belt of truth, walking in the light, no hypocrisy, nothing to hide, and it'll keep your spiritual pants up. Now, here's where we're going to spend most of our time. What does it look like? What does it look like when one does not put the belt of truth on? What does it look like? Go with me. Old Testament, all the way back to the beginning, Genesis. Our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. We don't have any record of God saying don't touch it. He said don't eat of it. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And so now the serpent, Satan, is getting Eve to believe that God has something that he's keeping from her. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, appealing, pleasing to the eye, I'd like to have that. And also desirable for gaining wisdom because of what the serpent just told her. She knows something that she did not know now. And so God's holding back. 
she took something, she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. They're naked as sinners now. It's shameful what they've done. There was no shame before, but the shame now is because they've disobeyed God. And they realize they've disobeyed God, and now, now the nakedness, they need to be covered. So they sewed fig leaves together. Man, you know you're in a hurry. I, I like to note every time. Look, we had a fig tree in my backyard growing up. Uh, it was dying. Uh, I had a pony. It was the first real answer to prayer. I prayed every night for years. God, if you give me a pony, I'll never give, ask you for anything else as long as I live. And God gave me a pony for Christmas one year. And uh, we built a little pen in the backyard. And, and a lot of you know the story. And the fig tree was dying next to the pony stable. And my grandmother got this idea to um, put fertilizer, pony dung. She dug down and she put pony dung um, around the fig tree. It did a miracle for that fig tree. That thing started growing and growing and blooming and then it produced figs. And I, I for years, we ate figs off of that fig tree. That fig tree got so big I could climb on top of the pony stable. That's how big it got. And the fig leaves got big. I know fig leaves very well. They are one of the coarsest leaves. They are not fruit of the loom. <laughs> It'll never get old saying that, but look, they, they, got, they sewed fig leaves together. They're in a hurry. Fig leaves. I, ah, man. I, it just amazes me every time I read it. But that's what it says. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And you get the impression that this was a normal thing that happens that God in the cool of the day takes a walk with Adam and Eve. But on this occasion, because they know they're naked, they know they're naked, they've disobeyed. And they hid, they hid from the Lord God. They hid from the Lord God. Among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. He called to the man. And what did he say? Where are you? That's an excellent question. I always like to remind us too at this point that the question is not for God's sake. When God plays hide and seek with you, he always knows where you are. Are you with me? They're hiding among the trees in the garden from God. God's going, I wonder where they are. He knows where they are. The question is for Adam and Eve's sake. Starting with Adam, he's the leader. He's the husband. Where are you? You never get tired of this study because it, it, it's so relevant. It's so, it's so relevant still today. Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Now, who did tell them that they were naked? Nobody. They knew. The conscience is defiled. The conscience is defiled because they've disobeyed God. And then God asked the straightforward question. Here it is. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? You hear this answer. Still today, the man said, the woman you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And I can't, I, I just have to say it. He, in the answer, he blames his wife. He blames his wife, but he also blames God. The woman you gave me, you gave me the wrong woman.
And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. God knows where you are. Without a word of knowledge or spiritual discernment that God alone can give, I can't look out at your faces and I can't look into your head and I can't look into your heart. And you can't look into mine. But isn't it fascinating that every person here tonight, every person, every person watching my live stream, every single soul, every single heart, God knows exactly where you are. I'm not talking geographically. You know, you, you know, what, I'm, you know what we're talking about here. God knows the truth about your life, everything about your life. He knows if you're hiding things from people. He knows if you're hiding things from your wife or from your husband or from your son or daughter, your mom or dad, your pastor. Your, God knows. He knows everything about us. Where are you? God knows where you are. Only question is, if there's something that needs to come out, if there's some confession that needs to happen, if there's some repentance, because without it, without it, look, you can't, you got you to gotta get your spiritual pants back up. Get the belt of truth on. Failure to put on the belt of truth will only lead to disappointment. And I know. Oh, I know. I memorized years ago numbers 32-23. Just that last part of verse 23. And it says simply this. Be sure, you may be sure, your sin will find you out. You may be sure your sin will find you out. And, and so the question, the question is, will you come out of hiding? That's the question. Man, that's the question. That famous passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. If you read the entire chapter, uh, right after John 3, 16, Jesus is the one talking there, of course, and he's the one that said, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son. And then verse 19, he says, this is the verdict. Light is coming to the world. And we read in the opening that God is light, in him there's no darkness at all. Light is coming to the world. But men love darkness instead of light. Because their deeds were evil. Uh, people attend church services and yet there's darkness. Things hidden. That's why the belt of truth is, is such an essential piece of the armor. So, let me give you our next example of what it looks like when one does not put it on. His name is Achan, Judges chapter 6 and 7. The Israelites are being led of the Lord in the land of promise, and they have finally crossed the Jordan River, uh, something the previous generation would not do because of their lack of faith. And those, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness and Moses dies, and now Joshua is raised up, and Joshua is our Old Testament Jesus, and Joshua is leading this next generation into the land of promise. First stop is a place called Jericho. God tells the Israelites in regard to Jericho in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 17. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. 
but keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you'll make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver, all the gold, all the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. And the principle here is God always gets the first fruits. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your increase. God gets the first, cru- first fruits. And so the first stop uh, in the land of promise is Jericho. And if you know the story, they march around the city uh, first day, and then they march around the city seven times in the, the last day, seventh day, and the priests blow the trumpets, and everybody gives a shout, and the walls of Jericho fall down, and everybody goes in, and God gives them great victory, great victory in Jericho. But then chapter 7 of Joshua, here's what it says. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. People wonder why Israel as a whole had to suffer for Achan's sin. Look, sin affects other people too. Achan has sinned. Uh, but he's kept it hidden. Chapter 7, verse 14, in the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family, and the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. What God's saying is um, everybody assemble, and God's going to whittle down from tribe to clan to family to individuals who have taken of the devoted things. Now, when the call goes out, you would think that Achan would go, I need to come clean. But he didn't. Verse 15, whoever is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He's violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was chosen. I wonder if Achan is getting nervous at all. The clans of Judah came forward and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by family And Zimri's family was chosen. At that point, surely you thought Achan would go, okay, all right. It's me. Joshua had his family come forward man by man. We don't know because we don't have the kind of detail, but how many men came forward before Achan? Man by man. And Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. You may be sure. You sin, we'll find you out. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. And finally, Achan confesses. But his confession is because he got caught. And I don't even want to read the rest of it because in that culture and under the law, they stoned him and his whole family to death, telling us that his whole family knew about and was part of what they had done. And it's just an awful, awful example of a guy who didn't have the belt of truth on and it cost him and his family dearly. And then there's a guy named Gehazi. The story is in 2 Kings chapter 5, and in 2 Kings chapter 5, it's the ministry of Elisha who took over for the prophet Elijah. Elisha had prayed that he would get a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and you know God honored that, and there are twice as many miracles recorded by Elisha as there were by Elijah. What 
a ministry to be a part of. What a privilege because Gehazi is Elisha's right-hand man. You talk about being in a great ministry and being under a great man of God. Gehazi, tremendous privilege. The Arameans, because of Israel's sin, are ravaging the land. Some of Israelites are being taken captive. And a young lady, Israelite lady, was taken captive by the Arameans. And, and there, Naaman. Naaman is one of the enemy warriors. Well, he has leprosy. You might know the story. Um, this Israeli girl who ends up becoming a slave uh, in enemy territory is owned by Naaman. Naaman is a great warrior, but he has leprosy. And the servant girl encourages Naaman's wife to tell him, hey, if you send your husband back to Israel, there's a prophet there and the God of Israel, he heals people of leprosy. So Naaman, if, you, if you're there, I'm just going to read this little section, 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, verse 5. Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. That's a lot of loot. He's thinking, well, I'm going to, I got to pay this guy, you know, for his services. And he gets there and verse 16 when he tries to offer basically the money and the stuff to Elisha, uh, Elisha says, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. Not in ministry for the money. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Naaman has been healed of his leprosy by Elisha. Uh, he's elated and he's ready to, you know, give him what he's brought. And Elisha says, no, no, that's not why we do it. But then notice what happens. Verse 19, after Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I'll run after him, get something from him. So Gehazi heard after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right, he said? Yeah, everything's okay. My master sent me to say, Notice what he tells him. Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. In our day, that'd be like saying um, two Christian college students just showed up on leave from Christian college. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. I mean, they're college students. Well, by all means, take two talents, said Naaman. And he urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. And when Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. And when he went in and stood before his master, Elisha, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? That's similar to the question God asked Adam, where are you? Only this is, where were you? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. It's a lie. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? And then he says this. Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. You just brought leprosy not only to your own life, but to your family. And then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become this white 
a snow. Gehazi would have been the one to fill Elisha's ministry after Elisha was through. And he ruined it. He ruined his future. Ruined his life. All because he did not Keep on the belt of truth. Now, I know you're getting tired at this point, 752. It's a good time for you to say a verse with me. Are you ready? On the count of three, let's say it loud. Not the reference, just the words on the verse. One, two, three. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And then there's Samson. I've done a lot of men's retreats and men's conferences over the years. I had the privilege of doing a lot of them and teaching at them. And probably, probably when I'm given the choice of what I'm going to teach on at a men's conference, I'll probably teach on Samson. And I probably have taught on Samson more than any other Bible character at men's conferences. We have this, um, I believe, wrong depiction of what Samson looked like. Artists rendering things like that, a lot of times will depict Samson with bulging muscles and he looks like a gold's gym kind of guy. I don't believe that at all. Because if you read the story of Samson, one of the things that is noteworthy about the story of Samson is the people could not figure out where he got his great strength from. And if he had muscles bigger than everybody else's and he was a Gold's Gym kind of guy, they wouldn't have been going, where in the world does this guy get his strength from? They'd have gone, well, of course he's stronger. Look at him and just look at the guy. You know, I, I think he might have been a smaller guy. Um, he might have been my size. But he had a lot more hair. (laughs) Because one of the requirements for his Nazarite calling, and he was called to be a Nazarite, a Nazarite commitment was not required under the Old Testament law. It was something you could do kind of like a special commitment to the Lord for a period of time. But for, for Samson... He had a special calling and he was to have the Nazarite commitment from birth throughout the rest of his life. And one of the things that you would not do during your Nazarite vow is you wouldn't cut your hair. Because at the end of your Nazarite vow, you cut your hair and you offer it to the Lord. So Samson's hair grew long and he never got a haircut until... You read a story about his life. He had an issue with lust of his eyes. He began a relationship romantically with a woman that was not God's will for his life. He had a problem with lust of the flesh. On the way to see this woman on one occasion, a lion comes out of the vineyard. And one of the things he's supposed to stay away from is anything from the vineyard. And so the lion comes out of the vineyard, the place of temptation. He kills the lion by the power of God, but he doesn't tell anybody. Isn't that interesting? On another date, he's going down. And by this time, the lion is a carcass, but 
bees have begun to take residence in the lion carcass and now honey from the bees being there and Samson's hungry and he reaches out and takes some of the honey from the lion's carcass. Well, another thing in his commitment to the Lord, he wasn't to go near a dead body. And anything connected with a dead body that touches Samson defiles him. And so the honey and the lion's carcass He's defiled, but it's this lust of the flesh that he gives into. And when people say, well, why did Samson do that? Well, it's very simply this, because it was so sweet. Honey in any other context would have been okay for Samson, but honey in the lion's carcass. So lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. And you also read about his bachelor party before his intended wife that he's supposed to marry this woman that was not gives God's will for his life and he just full of pride I'll tell you a riddle and the riddle is about what he did with the honey and the lion's carcass but he thinks nobody knows he fails in lust of the flesh fails with lust of his eyes fails in the pride of life His love life goes south because of his failures repeatedly. He ends up having a one night stand with a prostitute because he's starved for love and affection. And his whole life, his whole life. And what I like to point out if I'm teaching on Samson is when I go through the whole story, sometimes after maybe three messages at a men's conference, I'll point out at the very end, two verses, two verses that I leave out, that I leave out until the very end. And two verses in those few chapters in the story of Samson, here's what it tells us twice. God tells us twice. He led Israel for 20 years. Twice he tells us that. He led Israel for 20 years. And in the story of Samson that I can do in about 40 to 45 minutes, that 40 to 45 minutes covers 20 years of his life. And when you study his life, his number one problem, his number one problem yeah, lust of the eyes, yeah, lust of the flesh, yeah, pride of life, yeah, he kept sin hidden. He was a loner. You say, how does this fit into the belt of truth? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Years ago, I went to my two top associate pastors at my previous pastorate. And when I was ready to put on the belt of truth, because I had taken it off. And I went to them and I said, I want you to know everything about my life. And from here on, my life is an open book. You have permission anytime you want to ask my wife how I'm doing. My wife, I gave her permission this morning, I said, before I come to meet with you, that she can call you, either one of you, at any time and rat on me. Because I was done. I was done. Because my failure to don the belt of truth was taking me down a slippery, slippery slope toward not just disappointment, miserable failure, and probably becoming a castaway. Thank God for His grace. Thank God for His mercy. One of the best things you can have in life is someone else in your life. And if you're female, I would encourage you, other females. And if you're male, I would encourage you, other males. 
Anybody know the name Chuck Swindoll? Chuck Swindoll. I used to listen to Charles Swindoll. He was on the radio here, and I listened to him every single morning, Monday through Friday. I loved his ministry. Ended up buying some of his books. Uh, I, I loved his writings. You know, he was a great uh, preacher. He's still alive, but he's in his 80s now. He's approaching. He's approaching. He's, he's, he's going home soon. I'll never forget one time in one of the books I read by Chuck Swindoll, him sharing about a group of pastors that he was regularly meeting with, and they were accountability partners. That's what they call themselves, accountability partners, all right? And it was a group of them, and they had seven things that every time they would get together, they would go down before they would do their conversation and things. And, and they would ask them one another questions. Have you been with a woman in a bad environment? You know, that kind of thing. And the last question, after all these very personal questions they'd ask, and every one of them had to answer because they're being accountable to one another. The last question I've never forgotten. You know what the question number seven was? Every time they got together to be accountable to one another? Have you just lied to me? That was question number seven. Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you been viewing pornography or anything like that? Have, and then the seventh question, have you just lied to me? Man, we need, we need people in our lives that know everything about us. Now, it takes time to develop those kind of relationships. You can't just go to anybody and do that. But, man, if you've got people in your life that you could consider going and saying, you know, I want you to know everything about my life. And I understand what I'm saying. You've got to be wise. It doesn't mean you go home and tell every little spat that you have with your wife or your husband because then, you, then you're just gossiping, you know. We're talking about being accountable to one another like Solomon's talking about, where you can be strengthened with your relationships to one another, and you can hold one another up and encourage one another. And especially in light of what we're talking about in regard to the belt of truth. So that you don't have anything to hide. All right. And then there's Ananias and Sapphira. One of the greatest times in the history of the church and the early church in Jerusalem. And I mean, you got the apostles and every day they're teaching and miracles are happening and the worship had to be off the chart and God's adding to the church. There's persecution, but there's such life in the church and there's such unity in the church and all these great things are happening. And some people are being led of the Lord to sell a piece of property that they don't really need. And they take the money and they bring it to the apostles and lay it at their feet. And and the apostles begin to distribute to anybody who has need. And for a period of time in that early church, it says nobody had need because everybody's need was met. And Ananias and Sapphira, a part of that church, and they felt led to sell a piece of land and they sold it. But most of us probably know the story. When they got the check, where they got the cash, they said, we don't, need to, we don't need to give it all to the church. But that's what the Lord wanted them to do. That's why the Lord moved them to sell it, but to keep back part of it. And God gives Peter a word of knowledge. And he brings Ananias and Sapphira in his tent, one at a time, one at a time. Is this the amount you got for the land? And both of them lied. And after they lied, God took them. I did devotions with my children when they were small, but old enough to remember. And every one of my four children remember one of the devotions I did with them was on Ananias and Sapphira. And I said during the devotion, I said at the end, I said, now, if you lie, you might die. And every one of my children remember that devotion probably more than just about any other devotion I ever did with them. If you lie, you might die. And Ananias and Sapphira, one at a time, when they lied, Peter said, you've not lied to men. You've lied to God. 
And God took their lives. Well, as we bring it to a close, then there's a church of Sardis. Revelation chapter 3. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. But you're dead. When I did this years ago, God gave me the title for this particular message when I was teaching on the church of Sardis. What you see is not what you get. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Wake up. That's the counsel for this church. Wake up. Here's my final points. Uh, you can be a part of a good church and yet not have on the belt of truth. And an eyes and fire. You can be a leader in the church and yet not have on the belt of truth. Gehazi, right-hand man to one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, Gehazi, serving Elisha. I will never forget years ago when we got the news about Jimmy Swagger. Now, I don't know if that many name means anything to you, and I don't know if it does. If you know, you may go, well, that wasn't my particular camp. Well, I'll tell you what, though, he was a great, great preacher. He led a lot of people to the Lord. A lot of great things from his ministry. And when it came out in the open that he had picked up a prostitute, and then all the years and years and years of pornography and addiction to pornography and man somehow his marriage survived through all that his ministry was ruined and God restored him to a point but I mean just it was a sad day it was a sad day for the church Jim Baker PTL again whether whether you were you go, well, that wasn't merely my thing. You know, well, still, Jim Baker and his ministry, they led a lot of people to the Lord. When my mother was diagnosed with cancer, and I knew the Baptist church that we were a part of, if I, if I took my mother to them, they weren't going to anoint her with oil, and they weren't going to do that and lay hands on her. They didn't believe in that kind of stuff. And so I drove her from our hometown to Charlotte, North Carolina, to PTL. And they anointed my mother with oil. God didn't heal her, but I did everything I could humanly. And I believe some people were healed through that ministry. And, it, it, and just, I, I got word yesterday, a guy that I did ministry with in Russia for years and years and years, and he was on sabbatical. And he just was visiting our church just a few weeks ago. And I was told yesterday, it just came out in the open. He's been unfaithful to his wife. And they just, I just, it was, you could have punched me in the gut. Let me, let me just read you a couple of things. Jesus, listen, Matthew 23. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup. And dish, and then the outside will also be clean. You like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. On the outside, you appear to people as righteous, reputation of being alive, but you're dead. But on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Proverbs 4:23. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira. How is it that you have allowed Satan to fill your heart? Genesis 6, verse 5, every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
Psalm 26, 2, test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. Psalm 51, 10, create in me a pure heart, O God. One more, Hebrews 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I ended there with Sardis. Sardis was built on a small elevated plateau on all sides but one. There were rock walls and they were smooth and steep. And the only access was on the southern side. And even it was steep and difficult. Only on two occasions in history was Sardis ever invaded and overcome. Though over the years it was attacked often. Once in 549 B.C. by the Medes under Cyrus and again in 218 B.C. by Antiochus the Great. Each time it was like a thief. They never expected to be defeated. No one saw it coming. They were caught sleeping. And what does God say to the church of Sardis? You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up! Wake up! It's amazing the things that you can allow back in your life after becoming a Christian. Most of you know my story when I was um, a drug addict. One of the places I found to hide my marijuana was in between my bass drum shell and the foam that I had to muffle the sound of the bass drum. And my drums were in my bedroom, living at home. And uh, I would every night, I'd come in and I'd take my bag of pot and I would slide it in between the shell of that bass drum and the foam. And I thought, I have found the perfect place, perfect place to hide my marijuana. And for the longest time, nobody, nobody discovered it. Until one night, I'm rolling my joints in the bathroom next to my bedroom for the next day at school. And I just forgot and left the bag sitting on the back of the toilet. And my mother came in and found it and then came in with the bag and asked me, you know, what is this? And uh, I was kind of like Adam, only I didn't have a wife. I blamed my brother. I said, it's my, it must be Dwight's. <laughs> and I lied. But eventually I confessed. I confessed. But for the longest kind of time, I, I kept that hidden. Years ago, when our kids were small, my wife and I made the agreement that when our youngest, our daughter, learned how to swim, we'd refinance the house and we'd have a pool put in. We refinanced the house, we had a pool put in. This is one of the buckets for the chlorine tablets. I've later, I've since had it changed over to salt, so I don't really use the chlorine tablets, but this is an empty chlorine tablet bucket. And I used to keep alcohol hidden out by the pool. My wife knew I drank. During those days, there were times that we would have a glass of wine together with a clear conscience. We believed we had the freedom to do that. But for me, when I hit a wall in ministry several years ago, I needed, I needed, I needed, I wanted a little more to dull the pain, to just a crutch. And so I would go out and without my wife's knowledge or any of my family's knowledge, I could get an extra drink without anybody knowing. Well, let me tell you, I never got caught. 
at least with the bucket. I got caught in other ways. But man, when God so worked in my life several years ago now, over six years ago now, about six years ago now, and we won't go into the whole story, but here's the summary of the story. I had a revival. I had a revival. And I, it was like getting saved all over again. And everybody that knows me, including my wife, will tell you, I'm a different man today because of the revival that I had some six years ago. And one of the things I'm happy to report It's empty. And, and look, listen, but here's the best part. It's been empty. It's been empty. And I've had nothing, nothing to hide. It's such a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to get up in the morning and know whew, you can lock on the belt of truth. And you can walk in the light as he is in the light. It's a wonderful thing that I don't have to go around trying to hide something from my wife or from my kids or from you. God help us to put on that belt of truth every day. I know what it's like not to wear it. And I know what happens when you don't. And I don't want to ever, 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 ever go a day. I want all the armor, but I especially want that belt of truth. I know you do too. But bow with me. Lindsay's going to come, but just bow with me. Look, I, I know... I, there could be somebody watching my live stream. There could be somebody here with us in the service. There could be somebody that gets a hold of this message long after it's done. And the Spirit of God speaks to you through it. And just like God said to Adam and to Eve, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? especially in regard to this piece of armor, the belt of truth. Anything that's hidden that needs to come out in the open. Anything you need to repent of. I encourage you, if you don't have ladies, at least one other lady, that you can develop the kind of relationship with, that you can have an accountability partner in life. Man, if you don't have another man that loves the Lord, but you can look to develop that kind of relationship, where you can share your life with them and they can share their life with you in a way to strengthen one another so that we don't hide things from one another, so that we don't live as hypocrites and we don't allow the enemy, the enemy to take us captive, to destroy us, to rob us of future potential. Anything you need to confess before the Lord and then you determine, you determine who it is you're going to go to and confess that to another brother, if you're a brother, to another sister, if you're a sister. So you don't allow the devil to be able to put you back in that place again. Lord, thank you for the freedom, the freedom that comes and the strength that comes from donning the belt of truth. Help us, Lord, to do it every day, to walk in the light as you are in the light. Thank you for that privilege. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in my life. 
What a gracious, merciful God you are. Thank you for delivering me from myself. Continue to go before us. In Jesus' name, amen.